Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Newcastle Fast FM here on Monday, the 23rd of November. Jazakallah khair for joining us. May Allah bless you. Uh, may Allah bless all of us, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, and tonight is uh, it's going to be a bit, uh, bit more personal, a bit more intimate tonight, inshallah ta'ala, with myself and your and our special guest, Dr. Abdul Haq. Um, so we mentioned a bit um, because we had the the sudden loss of Sheikh Halabi uh, last weekend, and we spoke about him, and um, we talked about you know his character, his personality, and the impact that he made. And tonight we are going to be talking uh, on a more intimate level from myself, and our talk tonight is: Will you rest in peace? Two deaths. Uh, two destinations. And this is uh, poignant for both myself uh, because today is exactly uh, one year since my dad passed away um, on the 23rd of November in 2019. And we are very closely coming to also 11 years since Dr. Abdul Haq Baker's father as well passed away uh, just a few just a few days from today in December and so it felt um, that instead of not being present that we discuss it talk about it and use it as an opportunity to remind ourselves inshallah ta'ala of the blessings that we have as long as we are living breathing and of saying uh, a sound mind, inshallah, that we are able to make the most of what we can, inshallah ta'ala. Because indeed, subhanallah, it is a bode for everything. You know, everything organic will eventually uh, turn to dust. Even the suns and the stars that we see above us, even this whole universe will eventually uh, collapse in on itself. Because such are the things that are organic except for the one true creator, the sustainer of the heavens and the earth, the first and the last, the mighty and the majestic. So it's with that I pre open our presentation. And again, I, with the greatest of uh, respect and, uh, and the opportunity to share such personal and intimate stories this evening, inshallah, with Dr. Abdul Haq. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair for that um, uh, introduction, Brother Wajid. And I think it's important that, as you said, we speak about these losses and the importance of this um, topic, the title. And wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi to Brother Sterling, Dave Sterling, to Kira, to Ibtisam, to, to all of you who have joined us, mashallah, tabarakallah. And why, why did I choose this title, Wajid? Uh, Will you rest in peace uh, to deaths, to destinations? Because your father, Rahimahullah, died a Muslim. My father wasn't a Muslim. And I want to really share with the viewers the distinctions between our parents um, dying. You and I haven't spoken about your father's death nor my father's death, but I felt that we need to highlight um, the parallels that are there and the destinations that we know await humans, depending upon Allah guiding them and the choices that they've made because of what he's told us in his book, subhanahu wa ta'ala, because of what his last messenger, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, described for us of the akhirah and the abode of those in the akhirah from the grave to the final standing to enter in either paradise or hell and while we speak on this topic let's be clear this is applicable to non-muslims as well those who may have a christian belief uh, um judaic belief any other belief no belief atheism is a belief so that there is a hereafter and there's a final destination that we are going to based on how we conduct ourselves in this life and before we go right into the topic i want to highlight this as well i'll be speaking about my father 
a non-Muslim, a Christian. And one thing that we know it, that is cardinal, that none of us do, is we don't speak ill of the dead in the sense that we start chastising, abusing, whatever. Now, if we don't do that with non-Muslims, we have to ask ourselves as Muslims, how can we speak in the manner that we've witnessed individuals speaking, even those who profess to be on the Sunnah, in the way they were speaking about Sheikh Ali Hassan al Halabi last week and since that time? How is it we can hear some of the heinous comments about a person of Sunnah? And it doesn't surprise me that it's happened to him, aside from the, the plethora of praise that he got. But we saw this happen after Sheikh Ibn Baz, Sheikh Al Albani died, Sheikh Uthaymin died. I saw and read some of the most outrageous comments praising them and making supplication that they'd be punished in the grave, they'd be punished um, in the hereafter by those, those individuals who you can describe as nothing but people of dis uh, desires at the least and people of innovation and uh, going astray at the worst. So I'm saying that because I know what Allah says in the Quran concerning the plight of the non-Muslims. I know what Allah says in the Quran uh, describing the plight of the non-Muslims and the Muslims. I, I know of that. We know of that. But yet, once they've passed, we don't then start saying, Allah said this about them, curse, 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 curse. No. The matter is clear. So to speak in this way about Muslims, and we know that he or she would have their, their, their plight decided already by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the questioning in the grave, standing on the last day, and then that entry. So without laboring on that particular point what i want to do wajid and then come over to you many hear of narrations about the muslims and we hear about a lot of muslim deaths a lot of non-muslim deaths but we hear and i ask the same and make the dua for your father in the sense that may allah give him the highest place in jannah i mean at that point i can say that to you i can send that dua to, uh, uh, pray to allah for your father and every other muslim that has died, that Allah forgive him, that Allah forgive her, that Allah ease their punishment in the grave or avert the punishment in the grave and make it spacious, Amin, and that Allah enter them into Jannah, make their reckoning easy, Amin. But I cannot say that about my own father. While my father was alive, while my parents were, are alive, my mother is alive, my Allah guide her, Amin. While my father was alive, I can make dua for him. And I want to tell the story up to that point. I will stop, let you start speaking concerning your father, and then I will continue. So my father was Roman Catholic, and we were raised as Roman Catholics, mashallah, tarakallah. Um, I went to Roman Catholic school in the end, um, did well in school, everything like that. And I wasn't really practicing some of the time. Then I decided to practice. My father was very pleased about that. Um, I'd be going to church on Sundays. This was as a young boy. Um, when I got older, my street life, my road life took over, but I still had that conscience that when I was doing so many bad things that I would go to confession on a Saturday and say, Father, forgive me for I've sinned and the shirk that we used to commit and everything like that, because it was embedded in me as a Christian, as a Catholic, this is what we do, no matter what stuff I was doing out on the streets and everything. And that was such, such was the um, embedment of my father's um example even though my mum and dad divorced when i was young when i was about eight nine years old but i was a roman catholic i'm proud of being a roman catholic and even when i was on the streets doing the things i was doing so that was the impact of my father upon his children my brother older brother my sister and me now what happened and i don't want to labor this point too much i remember when I visited the UK, my father had moved back to Nigeria. He kept coming backwards and forwards and he'd married again. I've got two younger brothers. They're, they're doctors and graduates and everything now, but I don't know them that well. But I remember coming back on one occasion to visit. And my brother had told me, look, dad's here. He's going to have a, an operation um, on his um, liver or he's got, he's got, um, or his pancreas, sorry, he's got a problem with his that's all we knew it was going to be. Um, do, do you think you can come over? 
I said, I'll, I'll fly over. So I flew over and that would have been in uh, late November, early December, 2009. So I flew over, visited him. And it was interesting on this occasion because when I was visiting my dad, I got a phone call from um, my grandmother. I was her favorite, mashallah to her, non-Muslim on my mum's side from South America, Guyana. And she was in an old people's home, but she was terminally, she was ill, very ill. So the doctor contacted, contacted me and said, can you visit me? I said, okay, fair enough. On what, on what day? He gave me the date. And it was the same date that my dad was in hospital ready to have his operation in St. George's in Tooting. And my grandma was in a home in Mitcham, not too far away. So I went and visited my father. We were not particularly close. So I was the middle child. I was the rough one, always fighting. So the one who would get the beats from my dad and everything like that, which I remember because I was always fighting, as I said, and the middle child. So it was just me. I went to see him and I sat with him for a while. And I remember, this was the first time I remember my dad ever showing this type of affection to me in my life. Now, imagine I was, um, let's say, nine years ago, so I would have been uh, 43, okay, 43, 44. So I said, look, Dad, um, I've got to go because I've got to go and see the GP for Granny. Um, and then he looked at me and he said, do you need to go now? And that's the first time I detected concern in his face. He said, can't you stay? So I was like, wow, my dad's actually afraid. And I, we hardly see our parents afraid. So that, that struck a chord with me. And I said, dad, I promise you I'll be back. Um, I'll be here and I'll be here after the operation. But I'm, I'm going to go and see, see the GP, see what that's about with my, with my gran. And I'll come back. And he, he just nodded. He looked concerned, scared, actually. And I, I said, OK. And I thought, that stuck with me. So I raced over to Mitcham. It was pouring with rain that day pelting down with rain like it's never seemed like it never rained like that before i got to the gp sat and waited for him to finish his surgery with the patients then i went in and saw him never met him before and he said um need uh, i want to discuss about your grand's health quality of life and everything he said if she has a, a stroke or um a fit at any point in this time now we're not going to resuscitate her um because the quality of life will be really bad at that point and she was 90. So this was difficult for me. I, I had an indication this was going to happen because they said, we need you to sign the form because you are a guarantor. She's put you down as a, on her will as a guarantor. You're responsible for everything like that. And I asked one of my teachers, um, can I sign this thing? And he, he said to me, yes, you, you should sign it if this is the, the condition and you're sure that that's the condition. So I signed that form then at the, the, the search surgery. It's pouring down with rain, as I told you. And I said to myself, okay, I signed that and I left. I was quite sad when I left, as I said. And then I gathered my senses. You can't go and see your grand just yet. Race back to the hospital. So I raced back to St. George's Hospital, saying, right, let's see if I can get in before I see my uh, before my dad goes into um, for surgery. And what happened is I got the elevator up, went in, bed, bed was empty, looked at the nurse, she looks and goes, he was waiting for you. He's just gone down now. I said, what floor? She told me. So the lift was taking long. I bounded down from, I think, to the ninth floor, I can't remember, and I ran all the way down the stairs, racing, 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 racing. I got down, got to the theatre. I thought, oh, I've missed him. But he was just in the room next to the theatre, and I went in, he looked at me, and he's, he was on the anaesthetic, but he hadn't gone under yet and fallen asleep. And I saw the relief in his eyes to see me. So I went to him, and I kissed him, and I said, don't worry, Dad, everything's going to be OK. Um, I saw that fear had intensified. And he said, for the first time, you've got to understand this, for the first time in my entire life, he said, I love you. First time, never said it to me as a child, never said it to me as a teenager, when my mum and dad had divorced, um, he'd moved away when I was 13 in 1979. So he said that to me and that took me aback a little bit. So I said, I love you too, dad. He went in for surgery. I went tooting and I sat with, a uh, friend came to see me and I was due to fly back to um, Saudi the next day, late morning, um, early afternoon. And I sat, I remember, two in, two in High Road, Chicken Cottage at the bottom of the road where I used to live, Topsham Road, the family home. And I just sat there until, that used to be open really late. I sat there until 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning. One of my friends came and sat with me because he saw I was concerned. And then I was waiting, when do I ring the hospital? When do I ring the hospital? And I rang and they said, um, uh, yeah, your father's um, come out of the theatre now. The operation was successful. That's it. 
I was like, Alhamdulillah. And I flew the next day um, back to Saudi. All good. Got home, spoke to my two wives at the time. Then operation went successful, told my children, Alhamdulillah. I get a phone call the next day from my sister. She said, um, Abdul Haq, she's Muslim, Alhamdulillah, and my brother said, um, Abdul Haq said, yeah, she goes, you need to come back as soon as possible. I said, what's wrong? Dad's operation was okay. I said, um, they've detected after the operation, he has pancreatic cancer and he's got a few days to live. So I was like, subhanAllah. Said to my colleagues at work, um, I was the manager, I said, look, you guys are going to have to be without me for a little bit longer. Told my first wife, my long-standing wife, who's known him for most of her uh, adult life as well, said, right, you're coming with me. Dad's going to want to see you. And I, I had to make decisions on the phone. My sister was speaking, but she's stressed out. She said, look, our stepmother wants him to be discharged to come and stay at my home. She said, I don't think I can deal with that. I can't deal with Dad dying at home and the atmosphere that will prevail after that. So don't worry, leave it to me when I come. So when I got there, I went straight away, went straight to the hospital, Difficult conversation. I saw my father, saw the look in his face. He saw the look in mine. I tried to be strong for him. I was always the one being told I'm the strong one. And I said to him, Dad, and I said to my stepmother, I said, look, you've got to understand this. Dad, if you go into a hospice, I had to explain to him, if you go into a hospice, if things, if the comfort you need, the attention and care, the 24-7 care you need is going to be there. I said, we won't be able to give you that. At, um, Alison is my sister's name. Um, at Aquila is a Muslim name. We won't be able to give that um, at um, uh, Alison's place if you stay there. And I didn't want to say to him as well, and dad, imagine she'll have to live with the atmosphere knowing that you've died in her home. I couldn't say that to him, but that was on my mind. That was on my mind. Yeah, I spoke to my stepmother and I looked at her firmly because she was being really, um, I said, auntie, as I called her, this can't happen like this. I took to the side said, this can't happen like this. It's going to be too much for my sister. The hospital, hospice will give him com uh, comfort, everything like that. So then my dad saw, he knows, he usually sees me leading in things, the decision maker, and he looked and said, okay, that's fine. So then we signed the document, got him ready to take him over um, to the hospice. All this time, the anguish that was there, knowing that, well, hold on a minute, this is all the time I've got. I thought that there would be more time with my father. I thought I would see him, well, he, had, he had a good bill of health, there wasn't much that we had to worry about. And now this, and we've got a few days. Now I'd written a really long letter and I, I've thought about reading it out on air, um, but I've, I've done it in my Chronicles of um, UK Salafism, the second season, um, uh, the last episode of that, uh, 2009, I think it was 2000, yeah, 2009. I won't read it out here because I felt it's quite sensitive for me to read it. It was Dawa that I'd given him in that letter pleading with him, saying, you were the one who taught us religion. You were the one who showed us about God. Um, I, I want to share with you now that progression that I've now embraced a final religion. Um, thanks to you, Dad, because the structure of Catholicism, then when I became a Muslim, praying five times, I gave him all of that. I um, referred to Surah Maryam. I, I, I had the English rendition of the Quran. I read Surah Maryam speaking about Isa alayhi salam and his birth and Maryam alayhi salam and, and, and how she gave birth and everything like that. And he was listening. And my stepmother, um, his wife, took the, the book and she, I could see her reading. They were strong practicing Christians. And I could see her reading Surah um, uh, Maryam and reading other parts of the Quran. And I'd be saying to my dad, Allah's the first, he's the last. He's, and my dad was saying, yes, he's the first, he's the last, he's the Alpha, he's the Omega. My dad would be saying all of that. Coming to the crux now, I remember... I thought my, my dad and I weren't particularly close. But when I saw him sometimes in pain and you could see he was thinking the time's coming, the time's coming. My brother was there, my sister was there. I thought I need to be an example for them. My sister's very strong practicing. My brother's not really practicing that, that much, mashallah. And I was beside my dad like I wouldn't have been as a child. I had my mouth to his ear and I would be telling him how much I loved him. I'd be telling him um, that we're there. Um, I won't be talking and pushing the down with him at that point there, but I'd be there, right? But I literally, I'm saying to you, what you said, my mouth was on his ear, on his right ear, whispering in his ear how much I loved him, assuring him, everything like that. Some of my friends came and they didn't push the dawah on him, but they were saying, how are you, Dr. Uh, Mr. Baker? You know, your son, the university had written a letter, okay, my, the faculty, 
because I told them, look, this is what's happening. And that's why I didn't want to do the graduation in December. I said, can I do it? And my Viva was going to take place in January. And I was thinking, OK, I need to do what I can to see. I thought my dad would be alive for my Viva, for my PhD graduation. So they were kind enough and they wrote a letter to him saying, uh, Mr. Baker, do you know the achievement your son's about to go through? He's going to be called Dr. Baker's. And I gave my dad that, that letter. And I gave my dad my, my, my PhD. When I'd finished, I'd finished it in 2019, in November, but I bought him a copy of it. And I could see the pride in his face. This is just before he got to the, the stage when I said I was whispering in his ear and everything. So all of that was brought forward to say, this is what your son, because I was the one who was going to be wayward, in jail or dead because of my life. So I'm not settled down, no wife, no children, whatever. And so my dad saw, hold on, he's done, Tony's done good. Tony's actually not gone in the direction we all feared he was going in. He did a U-turn as a Muslim. And I'll rewind very quickly. When I became a Muslim, the first year of me becoming a Muslim, I ended up in hospital, St. George's, the same hospital my dad was, to, um, be, was in at that particular stage. And I had to have my first kidney stone operation. And all my friends around, a lot of them had become Muslim at the time. I'd just become Muslim. And my dad visited me at that time on my own. This is ironic. I'm just thinking about this now. He came and visited me. And he said, yes, I've heard you've become Muslim. And I know you're doing that out of rebellion. You're at that age and, and everything like that. And he would not accept that I'd become Muslim. That was in 19, 19, 1991. So let's go to 2009 now. Now it's my father in hospital. St. George's Hospital, the same hospital he visited me in shortly after I became Muslim. He was transferred to the hospice, as I mentioned. I'd read the letter to him or given him the letter to read um, or for my aunt to, to read, um, my stepmother. And then I remember on one occasion when we were in the hospice, I was speaking to him subtly about Islam. And I just turned and looked at him. I was looking out the window reading from the Quran. And I looked at him, I said, Dad, if you want me to stop, at any time, just just say so. And he didn't say anything, but he nodded. He looked at me at that point and he nodded. He wants me to stop. And my heart sunk. Basically, he was saying, I don't want to hear anything more about Islam. That was the clear message at that particular time. And my heart sunk. And I tried not to show my disappointment. I kept quiet. The thing that devastated me after that is that he had called and arranged and the priest came down in his robe, came down with the crucifix, came down with the communion water and the bread and everything and uh, with some other priests and they read the last rites over my father. I left at that particular point, went to the end of the corridor and I'll be frank, I'm not going to be all macho or anything and I wept because I knew this is the finality that's going to happen with my father. Now I stayed until Christmas night, Christmas night I stayed till and in the, the, that's in the morning um, what happened is I went, no, Christmas Day. So I went in the morning, left my father. My wife was there all the time. My brother, my sister was there. And I left my father that morning knowing that I was never going to see him again. Knowing I was never going to see him again. I went from there to see my grandmother. Went to see her. She, by, she wasn't speaking by this time. Kissed her on her forehead. She was just looking blankly at me, my mother, the favorite grandson out of all her grandchildren. And she was looking straight at me. When she saw my wife, that's the first time she tried to speak for the first time ever. And she's saying to my wife, she loved my wife, Um Yusuf. I know you, I know you. And that my, my wife was trying to hold down crying at that point because the first she'd spoken in years. So I left my gran, I'd left my dad, went to the airport, knowing that two generations I was never going to see again. And I went to the airport with that on my chest. Now, when I got home, and I'm trying to hold it down now, when I got home, very somber, went home, got back to Jeddah, saw my children, was really happy I saw my children, um, thought to myself, what, how, how does this look? What does this look like? Early hours of the morning, Boxing Day, I see my, my phone go off. I look at my phone, I ring my sister, he's gone. So my father had died on the Boxing um, Night, um, Boxing Day, early hours of the morning, he died. And um, what I want to stop at this point and say is, at that point, 
which is really painful for us as converts. And I want Muslims, you Wajid, everyone else to know this. At that point, because of what Allah has told us in the Quran, because of what we believe as Muslims, I could not make dua for my father anymore. I could not ask that Allah guide him to Islam, grant him Jannah. I could not make dua anymore for my father. And converts who have got non-Muslim members of the fa of family, and this happens, this is the reality that we face. This is the reality we face. So when I say we have that de two, two, um, two, two um, journeys, two destinations, I knew because of our faith, what Allah had said about the plight of those who do not accept him. With knowledge, they reject him. And I have to live with that. So when I hear Al-Nar, Al-Hutama, uh, Khalidin Afiha, all of these things here, some of us are thinking about our former loved ones who died as non-Muslims. That's the reality. Every year, when it comes to the 26th of October, um, December, that's the reality that probes, probes my mind. And I want, I, I, I'll jump, I want to talk about my granny in case anyone asks. She passed away a few months later. And what happened is her carer contacted me and she said to me, she calls me Tony or Anthony. Anthony, it's close to the time. I want to put you, I didn't know she was going to do this. I want to put you on the phone to, to granny. Can you speak to her? That was difficult. So I was on the phone to my gran, telling her how much I loved her, speaking about my childhood memories with her when she bought me my first pair of brogue shoes at the age of five, when she took me to the fair, and um, when she bought me um, uh, uh, candy, and um, uh, what is it, the, 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 can the fluffy candy, and I thought it was cotton wool, and she got upset with me because I wouldn't eat it, how I used to hate eating shredded, shredded wheat because I thought it was cardboard, and she would be getting upset with me. I was talking, saying all these things, and trying to really make a light matter. I didn't know if she understood. I didn't know if she could hear. She spoke to my wife and everything, and then I came off the phone and um, uh, the Kira told me um, afterwards, she's gone. Again, I could not make dua for my grandmother. I had to stop at that point. So that's the reality many converts face. So when we hear that, will you uh, rest in peace, rest in peace, rest in peace, we know as Muslims, the plight of the non-Muslims. So those of us who've got Muslim family, those of us who've got Muslim parents, really, you've got to be grateful. I, I envy you in a positive way because you can do sadaqah jaria, you can make dua until you pass. And you know you have that hope and that assurance from the deen that you will meet your parents in Jannah one day, inshallah. Me? and others like me, whose parents have passed away and are not Muslims, we don't have that. Can't hear you. I said I can't. I can't comprehend. I can't. My mind is. It's. it's there's no way because. Because only you you know what you're going through, and there must be feelings of. Sort of, there's a distance that happens then, isn't there? That you must be feeling this kind of almost like an isolation of, of, of what is a blood relative, but it's no longer that cry is not the same anymore, you know. And uh, to, to everybody who's commenting, Jazakul uh, forgive us for not uh, reading them out, but Jazakul for your uh, kind comments coming through, inshallah. Ta but uh, it's it's never easy 
to lose a loved one. But it's never easy to lose a loved one in that particular way because I think, alhamdulillah, like, you know, we, we, put, we give charity on behalf of people who pass away. So there is some sadiqah jari, you know, there's some uh, benefit comes from it. You know, uh, a couple of months back, uh, a friend of mine, we studied at university together. He, um, he was uh, in Dubai. And, and uh, I was in a lot of hours, you know, Sadiqa Jari was being given out for him, you know, water was also being put down for him, you know, there was something being done to, to sort of to just bring that all together, you know. That Your voice is a bit low, Wajid. Sorry, bro. Yeah, so it's, it, uh, you know, we, we give that thing because we give that some kajaria because we know that inshallah, wherever they are going, there's going to be some ease that is going to come from this. There is going to be some ease that is going to be uh, a rahma that is going to bring us uh, a mercy, mercy from this, inshallah ta'ala. And so, um, alhamdulillah, you know, um, yeah, subhanAllah. They're saying the sound isn't that clear for um for you, um uh, Wajid. Some of the, the viewers are saying the sound isn't clear. Um it's changed from what it was in the beginning. What what you're saying about the Sadaqa Jaria is is very true. Um and the helplessness there there isn't even a reward for me on anything I can do for my father. There, is, there isn't anything. Um, there's also that reality that when I want to try and get some sort of um, solace, I have to look at, which I do, uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu his family, non-Muslim family, uh, Abu Talib, when he was on his deathbed and the Prophet Sallallahu loved him dearly. And this was one non-Muslim who did a lot for Islam because of the Prophet ﷺ being his nephew. I also look at Ibrahim and the story that's there regarding him and um, his father, Azha, and the dawah that he gave to his father and that his father rejected the, the, the dawah of Tawheed, of Islam, and that he asked not to be... Um, uh, uh, Ibrahim asked that Allah not disgrace him on the Day of Judgment. And so we understand that uh, a ram will be placed, when Abraham looks up, a ram will be placed where his father was standing and cast into the fire. Uh, that's symbolic, not that his father has escaped or will escape the fire, but that um, he um, will still be cast into the fire. And yes, Sabrina, mashallah, you're saying you're not in the same position your dad was a Muslim, alhamdulillah, when he died. Um, sorry for making you cry. I'm, I, I, that's not the reason um, doing this. And thank you for your empathy um, in this instance. And uh, Sister Talk, yes, the reality of this world is heartbreaking. SubhanAllah, may Allah grant us strength. Ameen, ameen. So my, my thing now is, the reason sharing this today um, is because I think one of you said, Muslims take a lot for granted regarding parents. And you need to look at this as well. If you're not practicing the deen properly, was that the wish of your mother, your father, who's passed away? When you were born, they gave you a Muslim name that had meaning. When you were born, they would have been making dua for you. You may have had the adhan called in your, your ears, okay? They raised you upon righteousness, on a faith that is the truth. So those of you who've chosen to go away from that, some of you come back when your father um, or parent dies. Some of you come back, okay? Others need to take a lesson from this as well. Was that how your parents wanted you to be throughout your life? Can you still improve? Can you turn to a path of righteousness and do the good deeds in which they will earn blessings, the Sadaqah Jariah, and get that ease, and that you're supplicating for them. 
Imagine that you can do that. Imagine how easy it is that you can make dua for your parents regularly, asking Allah to forgive them, asking Allah to grant them the highest place in Jannah, asking Allah that you can meet them in Jannah as Muslims. That's all cut off from us as converts. It's all cut off. Because what Allah has said in the Quran is true. What the Prophet said was true. Again, look at the Anbiya and how Allah spoke and, and counseled the Prophet in the Quran that it's not him who guides, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who guides. He was to just deliver the message. And I have to take, and others like me take solace from that, that we, we deliver the message, but are we delivering the message correctly to the non-Muslims? That's another thing we have to look at. When we're involving ourselves in strife and turmoil and everything like this, and our parents are looking at us, whether they be Muslim or non-Muslim, and we may be adhering to the Quran and Sunnah stronger than they are because of the access to knowledge and, um, and maybe some of our parents are, are not literate. Are we showing them that the guidance upon which we are on is strong, is the haq, is the, the, the right thing? by our example, that we are leading by example, that we are following the Prophet Sallallahu example, that he came, as Allah told us, to create, to, to perfect um, character. Are we, are we upon that? Are we showing our parents that we have no gratitude or respect for them in the manner, that, the way that we're behaving? And that we even insult their practice of the religion, as some of us have done, as some of my um, peers, uh, brothers, sisters have done when they've become very strong on the religion. Maybe the mother doesn't wear hijab properly. Maybe the father shaves his beard. Maybe they don't pray regularly. Maybe there are cultural practices that are antithetical to Islam and we chastise them and we scor show scorn with them and we show that we are the righteous ones. Is this how we are? Those of us who have got Muslim parents, is this how we are? with our parents because i never even had the opportunity of being like that with my father because he was a non-muslim this is something we all need to ponder over how many of us are going to have regrets as muslims that we didn't do justice to our muslim parents how many of us are going to be in that condition how many of us, even once our parents have passed away, Muslim parents have passed away, and we've been good sons, we've been good daughters, how many of you have thought, I could have done more? I should have been more patient. I shouldn't have said, said remember, Allah says in the Quran, do not say oof to your parents. And that's an expression. Even looking at them wrong, the heart is thinking negatively about the parent. Oh, Muslims who have Muslim parents, you do not have the right to do that. You do not have the right ever to do that because Allah shows us that in the Quran. Look at the story of Jiraj and let's look at the story of the monk whose parent, his mother was calling him while he was in his monastery. And he was um, worshipping, he was a devout worshipper. And he heard his mother calling him. And he said, let me worship a bit more. I'm not going to go to her now. And she made a dua to the effect that she would not forgive him until he'd seen the face of a prostitute. So what happened? The hadith, the narration goes that a prince or a horseman was, was going by and... Uh, um, he saw a woman and prostitute and she became pregnant by him. But he was a traveler, he moved on and it was disgraceful. So they asked her, who was the father? Who is the one who you were pregnant by? And she said, the monk. I think the name, the name was Jay Drage. The monk was the one. So they went and they broke and destroyed his monastery and they dragged him before the, um, the ruler, the king. And as he was being dragged before the king, being accused of adultery, of getting this, this prostitute pregnant, and the, the, the prostitute was there and uh, some of her colleagues were there, and as he was being dragged before, he started smiling. And he was asked why he was smiling. And he said, because of my mother's dua. Because of my mother's dua. 
she would not forgive him until he had seen the face of a prostitute. And so he saw the woman as he went up before the judge. And he explained the situation. They waited to hear from the woman. And she said, no, it wasn't him. She admitted it wasn't him. Such was the dua of the mother about her son, who was a monk, a devout worshipper. A devout worshipper. Why am I bringing this to you all? One, we don't want our parents, and we as parents shouldn't make du'a against our children. Sometimes we get angry and we feel to do that because we know the du'a of the parent for or against their child is answered without doubt. That's one of the du'as that's answered, the one of the traveler, the parent for the son or daughter and the oppressed. There is no hijab between Allah and these, these three um, supplicants. So those of us who are saying off to our parents, we're neglecting our parents. We're showing anger and disdain for our parents when, when they're calling us and they're Muslim. Trust me, if I had the opportunity that you had, and I'm trying that with my mum now and trying to please her. And even though we have disputes and she's, we, we get into things, I try and stop. This is my mum, this is my mum. I don't want her to be angry with me. I don't want my mum to go without me um, there being goodness between us. She's 79 now. She sometimes watches these shows. There's the other narration. I, I don't know about the authenticity of this, but the meaning is that it's Sahih. There was a Sahaba who was on his deathbed in Medina Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went to visit him. He could not say the Shahada. He could not say the Shahada. They inquired as to why. The mother was upset with him. She was really upset with her son. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sent a companion to say, oh, um, so and so, forgive your son. Forgive your son. She forgave him. At that moment, he was able to say the Shahada and he died. I'll pass it to Wajid because I want Wajid to share about his love and his father. And I, I hope I've laid the, the platform and foundation for you to do so, Wajid, yes. giving you that contrast with what happened with my father. Muslims, don't waste this opportunity of having the blessing of a Muslim parent or Muslim parents. That's my request to you. Don't waste this opportunity. Start now if you haven't been shown the love and deference for your parents, who Allah guided to Islam, who you were born to, whose desire for you was to be a practicing Muslim, to be the Qur'at al the apple of their eye, the pleasure of the coolness of their eyes. And then remember this account that I had to go through and witness with my father. I haven't spoken about this before. It wasn't something I wanted to do at this stage, but when Wajid and I spoke maybe three weeks ago and I saw he, he, the pain he was going through when he's saying the 23rd is going to be a difficult day, um, and I said, no, let's do this. He said, I don't know if I'm going to come on the show. I hope he doesn't mind me sharing this now, but I don't know if I'll be able to do this. I said, no, let's do this. And it's coming up to the anniversary of my father's death. We need to share the same path in this life, that journey of life, two deaths, but two different destinations. So Wajid, I, I hand it over to you. Let us know a bit about your father. Let us know a bit about um, your experience, how you're feeling. Um, has this helped in any way? Um, it's really, please, uh, please share this with us. It's really shifted the way, I, I, um, SubhanAllah, like, you know, we never know how blessed we are until we kind of hear what other people are really going through and um, my dad came to the UK in the 60s and uh, he had no intention of staying until he realized how good the education system was and the NHS was there you know and he thought you know what this is this is the best start of life for my kids my dad wasn't really like that well educated a lot of his generation weren't that educated but he could read and write English in fact my dad, when he came, he came from Karachi. And when he was there, um, there was an Afghani friend who he made friends with who taught him the alphabet. And he said, this is, this is going to put you in good stead. You need to learn the alphabet. And then when my dad got here, he did what he was told. And he bought these children's books. And he started to learn English, you know. And then he could read and write. And then he ended up um, 
working for, for British Rail for many years. And uh, for about 15 or so years, he got Parkinson's. And he was, he's, those of you that know, it's a degenerative disease. And you start to lose your strength in your body and your strength of your mind starts to starts to go. And, uh, and it becomes very, very challenging, uh, especially from a cultural perspective, because we don't always recognize the physical symptoms of these illnesses. You know, uh, my dad sp smoked for many years. He stopped uh, well in the 90s. SubhanAllah, he was on like 40 a day, full heavy duty Benson and Hedges, you know, none of the light stuff. And that was it, you know, he was on, and he was, he was working seven days a week, double shifts, whatever he could do. He just got on with it. And uh, so we didn't see much of my dad. And then when he retired, it was like we were in our 20s. And um, it was a bit strange having my dad around then, you know, because we didn't really know him. He didn't know us as kids. So he didn't really kind of, so we kind of had to get to know him a bit more. And, uh, but, you know, as, um, as my dad's health started to uh, degenerate, it was, uh, it was very challenging. It was very challenging for all the family, you know, and, um, it takes, like you said, of the Haq, it takes certain types of leadership or uh, conviction to try and get things done. And sometimes, you know, whether it's culture, whether it's traditions, whether it's all these other things, you kind of fight them sometimes, you know. But uh, my dad was, um, he was into his Punjabi poetry, like spiritual type poetry. And uh, he used to read that a lot, he used to sing it. He had a beautiful voice. He was known for his voice. And uh, he was, uh, that was one of the things that when it started to fade, we knew he was getting ill. You know, it was getting worse. Because um, it was one of the things that he, he was always sharp on. Do you know what I mean? Like, you could drop a line of poetry and he would just pick up on it. Or if you said it wrong, he would chastise you and correct it. You know, it was one of his things. And uh, so he just, it just got worse and worse. And, um, uh, eventually, like he ended up in hospital, he got dehydrated. This was um, summer of last year, and uh, he ended up in hospital, and it became quite severe. The dehydration, and with lack of movement, he he ended up losing the use of his legs, and uh, so he was bed bound. Alhamdulillah, he came home, and he was okay for about a month or so but then he kept getting sort of fevers really high fevers and things like that and alhamdulillah was manageable there were care workers coming to the house checking on him all that usual stuff alhamdulillah uh, but at one stage i just remember it was um it was a thursday and the kids had just started school and uh my dad used to live he didn't live with me and um uh, I took my kids to see their granddad because they were all shiny in their uniforms, you know, and he was always very proud of them and uh, his grandkids, that is. And, uh, and you know, because, you know, like it, it, there's a t it, Parkinson's a type of dementia and sometimes you'd get really angry, you'd get really frustrated and he'd really have a go at you, but he never said boo to the kids. Didn't matter what was going on. If a kid came in the room, boom, that was it. Nothing. There was nothing. Like, there was a totally different person in the room. And this was um, this was a time which was very challenging because uh, he would hallucinate. He would talk about things that happened maybe 20 years ago, like they happened yesterday. And so all of these sort of stories. And, and then, you know, um, he'd, he'd wander off late at night. And so, you know, you can imagine there's there's a lot going on. And uh, then he lost the use of his legs. And uh, he was a man who walked a lot. You know, he was, he was known for his walking. Uh, and I say this as um, when I first went to Pakistan, uh, we went to see some family and we were passing through. And we live in a very mountainous, uh, tough terrain area. And uh, we walked and uh, my cousin says, let's go to that house there. And we'll get some water, it's hot, and uh, we'll carry on, you know. But me, you know, being English, you know, as they say, 
only mad dogs and Englishmen come out in the midday sun. And I was like, yes, all right. And he's like, no, no, let's let's get some freshen up and then we'll go. And when we walked on the courtyard and um, the dog came running and, you know, the owners come out, they tell the dog, shut up, sit down. And then he walked across this courtyard and the guy just looked at me and he said, you're such and such son. You know, you're Haji Karamat Hussein's son. I was like, yeah, how can you tell? And he said, I can tell by the way you're walking. And I thought, guys, you know, I didn't, I didn't take too seriously. And he said, you know, when we were kids, your dad and I we used to walk to this place and this place. And these places were miles away. And he said, your dad could walk in front of us and none of us could keep up with him. But when he went to England, we were rubbing our hands thinking he's going to come back soft. Yeah, <laughs> those smooth roads and platforms are just going to soften him up. And when he gets here, he's going to be weak and we're going to outwalk him. And when he came back, he still outwalked us. <laughs> you know, so, so, you know, he didn't soften up. And... Uh, but he was a physical guy. He was a very physical, like he could move. He, he just got things done. And uh, and so for him to be like stuck in his bed was like very frustrating with all of the other the other issues that were coming, you know. Uh, and there was a lot of balancing of medications constantly, just making sure he was comfortable. And then, like I said, it was September. It was a Thursday. I took my kids to see them. My dad had a fever. It was getting really bad. And then um, they called the doctor. And just as I was leaving, the doctor was coming. And uh, like, he, as soon as he saw my dad, he said, look, I, I, I'm calling an ambulance. And he called an ambulance. And that night, my dad went into hospital. And uh, and then my dad didn't come back out. Um, so he was in hospital for some time. And, you know, it was really challenging because he went from, you know, uh, asking me where are my kids, how is everything going, to not being able to speak after a while because his tongue had swollen and they ended up feeding him through a tube. And, uh, you know, I would go see him. I'd go see him maybe twice a day, three times a day, especially towards the end. And, uh, you know, he'd be sleeping and, and there'd be lots of people in the room because, you know, that's how we do, right? Everybody turns up, yeah? And he'd be sleeping and I'd be like, looking to see him open his eyes you know just to look at me just to look at me that's it and there were times he would look at me and like that's it there's the whole world didn't matter it literally like i you know you can't explain it till you've been there and i think you touched on that dr abdul haq a bit as well is that when your dad looks at you like that when your parent looks at you like that and then everything just nothing matters nothing exists nothing is important anymore and uh there was those moments a lot of them and I remember once there were lots of people there. My dad was resting and I didn't see him at all. And I'd been really frustrated because when I came early, I didn't see him and it was evening time. And I just remember, uh, remember just kissing him on the forehead, you know, and saying, okay, Deji, I'm going to go now. I'll come tomorrow. I'll see you. And he just looked at me and he went, like he nodded, you know, like, and he was just being cheeky because he was like, there's all these people here. I ain't got time for them, you know, and he was just, he was just resting. And, uh, and, you know, uh, I used to read uh, the story of Ayub, alayhi salam. And I used to read about how Ayub, alayhi salam, became really unwell. And how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala restored his health. And the story just gave me hope. I think that's what it was. You know, a very optimistic point of view. Always had a positive kind of thought process. You know, couldn't see the woods for the trees at that point. Uh, despite what was happening and uh, you know the on the night of the 22nd was a Friday night and my mom rang me and she said look because uh, my mom stayed over the last few nights because towards the end they, they said look uh, his quality of life is diminishing we're just de delaying the inevitable and we need to uh, we need to prepare for that so they removed the food tube uh they stopped hydrating him uh they just gave him meds to keep him pain free that that's how they said it. that's what it was about just keeping him pain free and so he'd he'd be resting he'd wake up he'd look at you he'd go back to sleep you know his eyes are closed and uh friday night my mom rang me it's about 11 ish she goes wajid i'm panicking mom never rings me at that time she never panics like that 
never has done. Uh, like stuff's happening, she'll call me, but not like that. So I, I went over, um, but he settled down. The fever settled down. Uh, they gave him some more uh, painkillers and uh, antibiotics was what they were putting into him. And then, um, then mum rang me again at Fajr time. And uh, just before Fajr. And so I went over again and uh, Alhamdulillah, he sort of like, he settled down. He was comfortable again. And then my mum said to me, look, just just go home. I said, look, I'll keep you company for a bit. And we just stayed, I uh, stayed till about, I think it was about nine, 10 o'clock. And the nurses came in and they gave my mum some breakfast, a bit of toast and a bit of cup of tea. And then my mum said to me, look, just go home and come back a bit later in the afternoon. And uh, that was the last time I saw him alive. And... Uh, <laughs> But you know, there's something, Dr. Baker, that um, was very powerful afterwards, you know, that I get a lot of solace from. And hearing your story, you know, it's it's completely contrasted. And it hurts me to sort of tell the story in this way. But, you know, my dad was, a, you know, he's was, he was a man from the mountains, farming background, simple kind of person, wore his heart on his sleeve. Uh, you know, knew the people that he liked, knew the people that he wasn't going to hang out with, did his thing, helped many, many families, you know, like old school, money back home, supported a lot of families. Education was a big thing for him. And, you know, in Pakistan, you have to pay for everything. You have to pay for your medicine. You have to pay for a prescription. You have to pay for a nurse to sit in the hospital with you. You have to pay for the sheets. You know, you have to pay for everything. You pay for the pens, you pay for the paper, you pay for the books in school. You pay for everything. So my dad would always say, if you if your kids are getting educated, I'll pay for that. Just don't get them working, get them educated. And as long as they pass their exams, I will pay their tuition fees. That was something he did very, very often within the within the area that we were in. And uh and you know, I said to my mom, you know, how 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 was it? You know, because I just remember she called about half past twelve and that was it. She said, Look, just just come. And I knew. I knew that was the, the last time. So I made my way over and, uh, yeah, he, he passed away. But my mom told me the story that, you know, she said, I said, she said he was suffering, Wajid. And I called the nurse to give him some more meds. And, uh, and, and she said she was going to come and uh, she did. And she, he, his dad settled down. And then, then he was struggling again and he was breathing very heavy. Like, <gasps> he was like gasping for breath. She said, I, got, I was like, mom was sleeping, resting. And uh, she said, I got up and I, I stroked his head. And I said, what's the matter? You okay? You okay? And you have to appreciate my dad can't move now. He can't speak, can't do anything. And she just said to him, you know, as we say in Urdu, kalma paro, kalma, read, read the kalma, read the shahada. She just said it to him. She said, I don't usually say that to him. I know he can't say anything. So I just said it to him. And he said, in that moment, Wajid, he said, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. And my mom said, I couldn't believe it, Wajid. It was like, you know, it wasn't that person. Like it was him from that time that said it, you know, with a clear, concise voice. Because my dad couldn't, he couldn't consume food because his tongue had swollen and they were worried he would choke. He couldn't drink that way. That's why the tubes went down up his nose, down the back of his throat, right. into his stomach. And then they had to do x-rays to make sure that the tubes were in the stomach yes. and not in his lungs to cause him pain. And mom said he read the shahada and I thought, subhanAllah, like, he's fine. So she said, I sat down and then he went very quiet. He went so quiet, I got worried. And I stood up and he passed on. Allah and Allah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And the importance, the importance, Wajib, that Allah gave him that ability to declare the Shahada. In that moment, in, in that, that moment, in of that moment, that in strength, that moment, that those words at that point, there is nothing, nothing that could be traded in this dunya for that moment. That declaration and, is the one. 
when I took Shahada, I was told this is the weightiest statement you will say in this life and in the hereafter. This oh. statement of Tawheed that Allah blessed your father to be able to say and many of our parents and many of the Muslims and, and that is a gift because some who were not in the condition of your father who've left, led a life of sin and mass. We've heard of individuals who, uh, when I was in Saudi, and uh, some sh shabab had died, the, the, the dad had gone for prayer, they were racing around in their cars as the story was said and one of them, on the, as he was dying and they were saying, say the kalama, what did he do? He started reciting a Michael Jackson tune. He started saying a Michael Jackson tune. Those were the last words he said. So Allah gives that tawfiq for us to say the shahada. May we all die upon the kalima. Yeah. Amin. May we all die. And uh, uh, just before we conclude, Wajid, I contrast that when my uh, late father-in-law, for my ex-wife, Pakistani, was Muslim, and he had a fall in Manchester, and I was on my way up, but I was going to Leeds that day. And he was asking for me, where's Abdul Haq, where's Abdul So they're calling me, Abdul Haq, where are you? Uh, granddad's has fallen, dad's fallen, can you come? So I went, and when I got there, I was supposed to travel abroad for a business trip, but I canceled everything and I stayed with him. I was his only black son-in-law, mashallah, tabarakallah. Now I stayed with him. My uh, fourth daughter from my um, wife had just been born a few months, a few weeks beforehand. So I stayed, as you said, the hospital full with visitors, guests coming to, they can see he's in a bad way, blood clot, swelling on his brain and everything. So I stayed with him. And with the little Quran that I knew, Jules Amma, I stayed and I sat there and everyone was going. And if I could have done this with my dad, wallahi, I would have done this with my dad. But I sat with my father-in-law and I just kept reading with the little tajweed that I had reading. Everyone went, and at one point, I stopped reading the Quran. It was late now. There was nobody there. It was late. I said to my wife, everyone, no, I'm going to stay with Dad. And I stopped reciting, and he opened one eye. Okay, he'd been sleeping. He was in and out of consciousness. He opened one eye, and I looked, and I saw that, and he looked in my direction. And all I said to him is, I said, Ami, do you want me to continue reciting? And he nodded. I was the last, last person to recite Quran to him. Now, wallahi, if I could have done that with my father, as a Muslim, I would give the world, yeah. I would have given the world to be able to do that with my father. Yeah. So yeah. what you, what your father, may Allah grant him Jannah, we can say that. May Allah grant him Jannah and Firdaus. Mm -hmm. May Allah give you the benefit to, and uh, the blessings to be with him and your mum and all those who love them and you be with those who you love, okay? As the Prophet Sallallahu said to that, that Sahaba, you will be with those whom you love. That's not the case with me in every instance. That's not the case with us as converts in every instance. Yeah, and, and I think, our, our, our I think we last forget words that privilege. To yeah, we think we forget that privilege of, of having such a thing, like I said, you know, my dad hadn't spoken for weeks, for weeks, you know. And I remember there'd be nights we would leave and say, look, dad, will you, you know, make dua for me? I'd say that to him, just make dua for me, dad. And he would smile and nod and that's it. There'd be no speech, you know. And so that very last moment for that to happen, subhanAllah, it's, it's, it's unfathomable. You know, in so many ways, but Alhamdulillah, Allah blesses to Um Seba Hewils. Yeah. And for me, that was like what I read in the story of Ayub alayhi salam. Alayhi salam. That in that, that last bit, that Ayub alayhi salam was rejuvenated and blessed. And I felt that not in the same way of comparing to a prophet, but I felt that Allah's mercy was upon my dad, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, that his tongue was given that strength at that time to do it because literally, like my mom said, at the next moment, he went so quiet. She said, I got worried, I got up. The nurses, they came in and they just they just pronounced it. That was it. And uh, alhamdulillah, like you said, I can make dua for him. I give as we do. You know, but like you said, you know, I, I forget the privilege that I have to be able to do the ability to do, uh, to make dua, to have given charity on his name, to have to make dua 
to to visit his grave and alhamdulillah this is this is such a rahma this is such a rahma and i think you know it's it's an inevitability i will be there too it might be tonight it might be tomorrow it might be a month a year 10 years whatever it is it's an inevitability for all of us they haven't gone they're just uh, telling us where we're coming to they're just making a way for us telling us this is the next step for us as well um because nothing exists forever nothing and uh truly blessed to be able to have such a blessing as as a father like that alhamdulillah and, and alhamdulillah 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 it is it's a mercy and also alhamdulillah to be able to to share with you dr abdul haq and to share with all of our viewers and listeners such an intimate story and uh, thank all of you for all of your comments jazakallah khair and uh, like dr abdul haq said you know i was really considering what to do for tonight um earlier today i spent some time with my mom it's very challenging with quarantine it's very difficult uh because she's she's an she's an old lady <laughs> you know uh somebody who you see in the street and call her auntie g you know she's that lady and uh but alhamdulillah you know what i can do to at least give her some some happiness inshallah um this has been a reminder of that this has been a reminder of that inshallah and uh to work diligently that indeed there is a there is a next stage a next phase and uh yeah jazakallah khair for everybody for everybody who's tuned in and uh i pass to you dr abdul haq just to give our closing remarks tonight please jazakallah khair jazakallah khair, jazakallah khair for sharing that um wajid jazakallah khair to everyone for um being involved um tonight and as i said last week we remember that ayat kullu nafsin ikutul mount every soul must taste, will taste death. And that hadith um, that even Sheikh Ali Hassan cited in, in his 40 hadith um, collection, take benefit of five before five. One of those was your, sick, your health before your sickness. Another one of those was your life before your death. I would add, from this moment now, those of you who have got Muslim parents, come correct really deal with things from this moment now even if it's a dua that you are making for the fact that you've got muslim parents that you can pray for in this life and when they've gone on to the next one those of us who have got non-muslim parents still alive keep making the dua keep making the dua keep being good with those parents and i say this to myself first and foremost check yourself before you interact with your mother or your father or whoever it is of your non-Muslim parents that are alive. You don't want to be in a situation many of us have found ourselves in with a parent that's gone that we cannot make dua for. A parent that's gone that we hear recitations of the Quran describing Jannah and Nah, and we know which one that Allah speaks about concerning our parents who are non-Muslim. This is a reality. Yeah. This is a reality. Let's remember that, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Barakallah fiqh. Barakallah fiqh, inshallah. And uh, inshallah, we'll be back, inshallah ta'ala, next Monday again. Jazakallah khair for all of your du'as, for all of your interactions this evening. Uh, we haven't really read off our feed but it's been appearing on the screen as you've seen and we thank all of you all of you sincerely for your input for making the shows as interactive and as personal and as much of a blessing as they are alhamdulillah may allah keep us pure may allah keep us sincere and may allah bless us and guide us so that we may be truly amongst those who are successful in this life and in the hereafter inshallah ta'ala assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
Oh.